If you've got a Bible, ooh, um, it's, it's loud today, isn't it? Um, if you've got a Bible, do um, keep it open or on your phone. Um, I've got a spare Bible if anyone wants one. Just put up your hand. No, good. And am I going to stand in the middle of the screen? That's not going to be good. Have we got a PowerPoint there? Ah, oh, brilliant. One life, live it. Good. And thank you for praying. Does what I do with my life matter? Thank you. <laughs> Sermon over. <laughs> um, I'll ask that again. Does what I do with my life matter? Um, I'd like to start with a quote from Tony Hancock. Let's see if this works. Does anyone remember Tony Hancock? Hands up if you're... Um, Hancock's half hour. Yes, next slide. Uh, keep going until you get a black and white person. There we go, thank you. Hancock's half hour. Um, in his last TV monologue in 1964... Um, he was reflecting on his life. I won't do him justice, but this is what he said. What have you achieved? What have you achieved? You lost your old chance, old son. You contributed absolutely nothing to this life. Waste of time you being here at all. No place for you in Westminster Abbey. The best you can expect is a few daffodils in a jam jar on a grave and a black stone bearing the legend, he came and he went. And in between, nothing. Nobody will even notice you're not here. After a year, somebody might say to you down the pub, where's old Hancock? Haven't seen him around lately. Oh, he's dead, you know. Is he? Right, raise and Detcher, that is. And ironically, a couple of years later, Tony Hancock took his own life. Um, more recently, our local comedian, Rowan Atkinson, um, put it more concisely. He said, life is like a broken pencil. Pointless. <laughs> we do need to know why we're here. We do need to understand why we live each day. Um, why it's worth the effort. When we get older, we need to be able to look back and, and say, I haven't laboured here on earth in vain. I had a conversation uh, last week in clinic with a, a colleague. He said at the start of the clinic, um, we were talking about jobs, and he said, don't waste your life, Tim. Um, at the end of clinic, as he left, he said, I'm going to a funeral tomorrow. My friend was 39. He went to the gym and dropped down dead. There was CPR, there was an external defibrillator, all in vain. He said, don't waste your life. He and Tony Hancock are right about one thing, which is that life is brief. And as the logo on, logo on the Land Rover said, you've got one life, so live it. But the question is, how are we to live this life, this one precious life? Does it matter what I do with my life? And today we're in the middle of this series from Matthew, um, chapters 24 and 25. And Jesus gives some very stark teaching about what it means to live our lives now at this point in history. In the light of his teaching, that one day Jesus is going to come back. This Jesus we've been singing to and praying to, and we've committed our lives to follow. And we're going to give him an account of how we lived. So today we've got two parables, but they're on one theme. And in, Je in them, Jesus says, be ready for his personal return by expecting a long delay, by knowing him personally, and by using the life he's given you that he's entrusted to, your, to you in his service. So as we look through, we'll look at three sets of people. Firstly, we're going to look at the wise and the foolish bridesmaids. So look at Matthew 25. Um, so in this parable, Jesus teaches that though there will be a long delay, he is going to return. So we need to keep watch by knowing him personally. Jesus is preparing his disciples for what's going to, going to come. He will die and he knows he's going to rise again, and he will be enthroned in glory and receive all authority in heaven and earth. Those events have now taken place for us. But he also told them about events which would have been in the future for them and are still in the future for us. Uh, but Jesus said one day he would return personally and visibly to earth, and that every eye would see him. In chapter 24, Jesus taught that because of that, his return would be sudden and it would be divisive. Uh, so we must be ready Jesus said that no one knows the day or the hour, and so we must stay awake and keep watch. But the question we were left with last week was, well, what does it mean to keep watch? How do we do that? And this parable answers that question. 
And it shows us how to be wise and not foolish. None of us wants to be foolish. So let's start by looking at the five foolish virgins and, and look at how, how to be foolish. Don't try this at home, guys. Verse 1, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Sorry, you can move on to a different image. Anything else? Thank you. Um, it may be easy to miss the claim that just as Jesus has just made. Um, he's describing himself as the bridegroom. I hope you're excited by that. I, I love that name of Jesus. Um, for Jews who knew the Old Testament imagery, there was no mistaking what he was claiming, that he, the bridegroom in the Old Testament is no less than the Lord Almighty, God himself. So you might turn to Isaiah 54, which says, Your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. He's called the God of all the earth. Don't miss it. Jesus is presenting himself as the bridegroom. These virgins who are somewhat equivalent to bridesmaids today are... Um, they're there to welcome the bridegroom and take him into the bride. And I think their lamps are quite important. It would look nice. People worry a lot about the wedmen and how it looks as you enter the wedding venue. But also there was no electricity, so I guess if they were going to have a party, they would need some oil lamps burning. So what is it about these five who are foolish? Several ways to look foolish. Firstly, merely look the part. Um, all ten would look the part, wouldn't they? Um, imagine the wedmen involved. Um, if you're planning any weddings, you've got children of marriageable age, then um, this afternoon at Great Milton there is the Oxford Wedding Fair. You can nip along there after the service and um, you can learn about how to get coordinated bridesmaids' shoes. Um, when I got engaged, um, I nipped off to Nepal and left Naomi in charge of for 10 weeks of all the wedding prep. It was great. All I had to do was write the speech, which I finished literally an hour before the service. Um, anyway, the virgins are all there with their lamps uh, and I'm sure it will be today it will be colour-coordinated and ethically sourced. Um, and they're planning to meet the bridegroom, so they all look ready. <coughs> and looking to part, for us as Christians, is quite straightforward, isn't it? You, you go along to church, you sing the songs, you say these words about Jesus' return, and give every impression that you believe them. We sing that we're looking forward to Jesus' return, and we all look the part. And there's nothing wrong with that. The wise virgins also look the part. But if you look really closely, there is a difference. The five foolish ones don't have those flasks of oil. It's a small, but it's the vital difference. Next way to be foolish. Assume you have the right contacts. There's this striking phrase, at midnight there was a cry. If you think back to the Old Testament, we hear that phrase, don't we? In Exodus 12. And it was a very serious moment. At midnight... The Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon and the firstborn of all the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all his officials um, and all the Egyptians got up during the night and there was loud wailing in Egypt for there was not a house without someone dead. So in that Old Testament imagery, a cry at midnight should just make us stop and think. This was a cry of judgment and sudden division. Back to the parable. The bridegroom was a long time in coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, here's a bridegroom, come out to meet him. There is a long delay, but sure enough, the bridegroom will come. And then what? All those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. Lamps about oil are as useful as a chocolate teapot, aren't they? Now the foolish find, find themselves literally in the dark. They said to the wise, give us some of our, your oil, our lamps are going out. You can see what's going on. They, they think they'll be all right. Um, we, we know the wise ones. We can just ask them. We spent time together with them. They're our friends. We'll be fine. Except they won't. No, they reply, there, there may not be enough for both you and us. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. You cannot have a second-hand faith. Other people can't do the believing for you. Other people can't know Jesus on your part. Lots of people in this country have grown up in Christian homes and gone to churches, maybe many hundreds of times. Maybe they were all involved in Sunday school or a Christian union at university, summer clubs. Surely that all counts for something. Even today they might be involved in some Christian things. They've got friends who go along to church and sometimes they go with them. So the thinking goes, surely if it all turns out to be true, I'll just fall in with my Christian friends and it'll all be okay. They'll get me through. That's how to be foolish, says Jesus. 
It didn't work for them and it won't work for us on the day of judgment. Or if like that chap who went to the gym, life just stops. Next way to be foolish. Presume it'll be all right on the night. Are we ever like that in our thinking about other things in life? So the plan so far for borrowing from their friends hasn't worked, but not to worry, we'll blag it. We'll work it out on our own. Where there's a will, surely there's a way. Actually, in, in medicine we say where there's will, there's always a greedy relative. But that's something else. Um, I mean, if we look back on our lives, maybe there have been crises where we've muddled through, and it just turned out okay. So the assumption goes, well, at the end of time, I'll, I'll work it out. Verse 10, while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who already went in with him to the banquet, and the door was shut. A shut door in your face gives a clear message, doesn't it? No entry. But still the foolish virgins don't give up hope. Later the others came up and said, Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. They're trying it on, they're talking the talk, blag their way in. It's worked numerous times before, so surely this time. But the door stays firmly shut for all eternity. Last way to look foolish, not know the bridegroom. Actually, I've done this. <laughs> it was quite funny. Naomi and I went to a, a wedding in um, Monkton Coombe School, um, and it was November and it was dark when we turned up. And um, we'd done well with sat now to get there. And we went in and we put our gifts on the table and we started joining the party. We took the free champagne and, and we looked around and we thought, we really don't know many people here. Actually, we don't know anyone. <laughs> uh, and after about five minutes, you realised... It wasn't the right wedding. There were actually two weddings at Moncton School. <laughs> so we put the wine back, grabbed the myth. Uh, but not knowing the bride's groom was a way to look very foolish. Um, weddings are different now, but you know the scene. As an usher meets you at the door and they ask, are you for the bride or the groom? The assumption is you will have a relationship with one of them. The assumption is that when these virgins are waiting for the bride, then they would have known him. But hear those devastating words on the lips of the bridegroom at the door. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. How could this have happened? They all looked the part. They said to him, Lord, Lord. They sang the Christian songs. They'll say, Jesus is Lord. But there's this shock in store on the day that it most matters. We'll hear these same words. I tell you, I don't know you. These virgins weren't excused entry to the party on a technicality. It's really important to get this. The bottom line is that they never knew the bridegroom. There was no relationship there. That was the fundamental problem. So four ways to look foolish. Merely look the part, assume that you have the right context. Presume it'll be all right all the night. But ultimately, it all comes down to this last one. Um, not to know Jesus, who is quite clearly the king of God's kingdom, who is alive and reigning today, and who has said quite definitely that he will return. And Jesus is the most loving man who ever lived. And these words are hard, but he says them because they matter to us. So what does this parable mean to us? Well, the parable calls on us to know the Lord. The guests and the wise virgins knew the bridegroom, so they went into the celebration. There's good news here. There is joy in this passage, okay? Don't get that. Um, uh, don't miss that. We're in Lent at the minute and looking forward to Easter. And at Easter, we'll remember the first Passover when Jesus died as a sacrifice for us so that we could enter that party to enjoy eternal banquet with him in heaven. Earlier in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus said, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Come to me, all who labour and are heavy laden. Ultimately, the only thing that matters is that personal connection with Jesus. And we can all have it. The invitation is open to everyone. He is the bridegroom. He is the Lord God himself. He's looking for people invited. So, Know the Lord. Well, we've seen the fundamental differences whether or not you know the bridegroom, but what the foolish don't recognise or maybe choose to ignore is that knowing the bridegroom will make a big practical difference to their lives day by day. To know Jesus does demand a response from us. So they knew the bridegroom and they'd heard him say that there would be a delay and that made a practical preparations as a result of that. Um, so they took along the extra supplies of oil Maybe they knew the bridegroom's character. Look, if this was my wedding and you knew me, you would come well prepared for a wait. Um, 
I, I can be late for anything. In fact, Naomi says my gravestone is going to say that took longer than I expected. Um, <laughs> last year, I arrived three hours early to the departure gate for a flight, and I still missed it. Um, <laughs> I once, at the age of two, missed my own birthday party because we got the time wrong. Um, <laughs> you can ask me about that one afterwards if you'd like. Even on my wedding day, I found myself with a time issue. Um, part of my plan, which was complex, depended on me cycling across Oxford um, in July, um, wearing black uh, gown and um, suit, but I hadn't planned for the, uh, the puncture. So I was carrying a green mountain bicycle and the yeah, the speech I'd just finished writing to my church, thinking this is not how it's supposed to be. So if you knew the bridegroom, you would have come expecting a delay. In the parable, the foolish knew nothing about the delay. They thought they wouldn't need the oil. It just shows they weren't really listening. They didn't really know the bridegroom. So I wonder if it's time for you and I to re-enliven our walk with the Lord. Perhaps there's a call from God, a challenge to, um, to talk this through with God later today, uh, to think about how you can refresh your Bible reading and your prayer life. If, if that's God's call to you today, then just focus on that. I'd like to talk more briefly about the other parable, though. Because Jesus goes further in verse 13 and says, therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. So what does it mean to keep watch? Well, secondly, we'll look at the good and faithful servants. Um, in this parable, Jesus teaches that, there, that our lives are a stewardship from God and only for a time. God is extraordinarily generous to us and he's entrusted to you the incredible lift of a, gift of a life to live for him in his service. Okay, verse 14. Again, it would be like a man going on a journey who's called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two, and to another one bag each according to his ability, and then he went on his journey. Jesus is the master, and his departure is his ascension to heaven, which happened a few weeks later. Um, it's a journey he's going to come back from, and he leaves his wealth with his servants. That's you, and that's me. And we need to understand how extraordinarily generous Jesus is in what he gives here. The word for servant actually means slave, Slaves were often artisans or craftsmen who would have carried on an independent business under the umbrella of their master and they would have shared the profits with him. And the commands to commit sums of money to the slaves on investment, he expects a return as the ultimate owner of their business. But the wealth he leaves here is staggering. Okay? A denarius was a day's wage, but a talent is a precious metal weight worth about 6,000 denarii. If you go to the British Museum in London, you can see a talent. It's a, it's a stone like this, and they've got this talent, and you have to imagine it made of solid gold. Okay. So it would have been about 20 years' earning power for the average servant. Um, five talents would be more than we could earn in a lifetime. He has enough generosity to entrust it to these people. It does not belong to them. They're stewards for him. And in the same way, our lives don't belong to us. We're just to steward them for a while. We've been entrusted and only for a time. God is our creator. Our lives, our gifts, our wealth, um, our situations, our work, our families, our knowledge of the gospel, our opportunities to live in this world, they all belong to God. And they're entrusted to us temporarily. Uh, and there will be a day of reckoning I just had my council tax bill for you this morning as I left the church. I saw that. There's a day of reckoning I will have to pay. Um, and he expects one day to, from us to hear an account of how we've lived our lives. It will come when we're not expecting it, but the good news is we can prepare for that day of reckoning. The man who received the five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also one who had two bags of gold gained two more. But the one who had received one, went off and dug a hole and hid it in the ground. Three slaves, two different patterns of behaviour. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with all of them. Which makes it clear that he was expecting a return from the investment. There's a gravestone in Woolwich Cemetery, um, <laughs> which reads, um, so the, the commendation is, come and share your master's happiness. Um, but you may have heard of this gravestone in Woolwich Cemetery, which reads, Sacred to the memory of Major James Brush, killed by the accidental discharge of a pistol by his orderly, 
14th April, 1831. Well done, good and faithful servant. <laughs> um, both these servants, the good servants, are faithful and they receive the same reward, the same commendation, exactly word for word, isn't it? God expects us to use our lives in his service for his glory. That's his will for us. I don't think this is just talking about um, spiritual things, by the way. Romans chapter 12 teaches that we're to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, which is our spiritual worship. So our spiritual act of worship is everything we have in life, everything we are, our lives. Okay? This passage is not just talking about what we do on a Sunday. He's not just interested in evangelism or Bible reading or prayer. He gave us a whole of life, so we're to spend the whole of a life in his service. Our lives aren't for defending or hoarding or protecting or preserving. They belong to God and he wants them spent according to his will. And as we do that, an amazing thing happens. Verse 21, you've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Verse 29, for whoever has will be given more and they'll have an abundance. As we spend our lives in God's service, we receive more. As we serve, we're replenished and we're refueled. Uh, There's a lovely verse in Philemon, verse 6, which says, I pray that you may um, know, how's it going? I pray that you may be active in sharing in your faith so that you may have a full understanding of the riches we have in Christ. Okay, as we give our faith to someone, we, we, we discover more the riches we have. That's always the pattern in the Bible. The more we give away, whether we give of our love or our time or our wealth or our faith, we receive back far more. So Jesus, the message would be, if you're full of doubt, well, try sharing your faith with someone. Um, it really works. There's nothing that builds up your faith more than talking to someone who, who doesn't share it. If you're anxious about your money, well, sounds perverse, but try giving some more of it away. And you'll find that you do that in trust of God, and he takes away the worry. And I can hear some saying that's true. It, it is true. Sorry, there's a few jerky illustrations, but I, I do like the illustration of the... Um, the chap who was always worried about money, and he was worried about everything, actually. He was very anxious. Um, But his friend met him once in the street, and he was smiling. He looked like a weight had been lifted off his shoulder. And the chap said, so so, so what's made the difference? He said, oh, I found someone to do the worrying for me. I I pay him to do the worrying. He does all the worrying, and I just get on with life. It's great. He said, wow. So how much is that costing you? He said, oh, it's about £10,000 a week. Pounds. How do you afford that? Don't know, it's not my worry. <laughs> Sorry, it doesn't serve a sermon at all. But take a moment to ask, how has God invested in you? What has he given you particularly as a person you are, the situation you're in, and the life that you're living? How does he want you to serve him? Let's be specific. So youth, your lives are still ahead of you. What are your ambitions for your lives ahead? There's so much you could do. There's so much opportunity you still have to be comfortable, to be famous, to be successful, to have exciting holidays, a smart car, and a tidy nuclear family. Or are you ready to ask God, what are his priorities for you? It's a dangerous prayer, but it's a great prayer that I was encouraged to pray many years ago. Um, What is it, God, that as a person that I am with the gifts you've given me that would bring greatest glory to your name? It's a dangerous prayer, but one worth praying. Working people, I, I'm not sure how easy you find your job. Um, I've been practicing resilience this week, but I had some encouragements at the end of the week. So it's all, whether you're in a happy place or uh, now work is hard, it is the place that God's called you to be today. God's put you there for a reason. Um, so what will it mean for you to work with all your heart as for him uh, and not for yourself, not for men? So many of us resent our workplaces uh, and our employers. I just resent my workplace when it's March and there's a first blue sky day and I'm stuck in a neon-lit concrete block surrounded by concrete car parks. I want to be out there. Um, We have a a prayer meeting at work with some colleagues and one of them is a cleaner. And every week we share a prayer request and she just says, I'm so thankful for my job. I just thank God for it every day out of it. And that's just what she wants to pray every week. I'm so challenged and encouraged by her humility and her joy. God's given her a position, and she's honouring him with it. Married people, what will it mean for you to serve God in your marriage, treasuring your spouse and putting them first? 
even, especially if that's not easy. How can you work at your marriage? Parents, what will it mean to bring up your children? Uh, one of my colleagues regularly tells me she resents her children, and that really hurts. Um, if you're a parent, God has invested in you, uh, and one day you're going to give an account of your parenting to God. Um, if you struggle with that, then, then do chat with others for advice. Carers, some of us are caring for frail people. That can be so hard and often thankless, and it can be a burden, but the people God has put you here for in this world are, are the reason that he's invested in you. They're, they're the reason you're here for at the minute. They matter to him, and he's put you in, in charge of them. Good. I guess I'm talking in terms of relationships a lot here, but those are the ways we express our gifts and use our opportunities. Uh, and in witness to those around us who don't know Jesus, uh, isn't God's greatest investment in us the gospel and that we can share that? Uh, and that um, has got to be one of the key applications of this passage. Um, I'd like to show you some words from C.S. Lewis, which I found particularly striking, and I, I might have mentioned them a few weeks ago, but they're worth hearing again. They might even be here. Yes. He writes this in The Weight of Glory, which he preached in 1941 down at the University Church at St. Mary. And it talks about how precious the people God's put around us are. The load or weight or burden of my neighbour's glory should be laid daily on my back, a load so heavy that only humility can carry it, and the backs of the prouds will be broken. It's a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses. Uh, to remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you can talk to may one day be a creature of which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship, or else a horror and a corruption which, as you now meet, if it, at all only a nightmare. You have never talked to a mere mortal. There are no ordinary people. Nations, cultures, arts and civilizations, these are mortal, and their life is to ours the life of a gnat but it is immortals whom we joke with, whom we work with, whom we marry, snub, and exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. People are deeply precious. God has invested in you a life and in the lives of people around. Um, he has called you to be a steward of one life. The question is how will we live it for him? Thirdly, I'd like to look at the worthless servant. I've probably gone on a bit long. Um, you still with me for the last five minutes? Five minutes. We can't, we can't miss out the worthless servant. But they're, they're tough words, so I'm sorry. The man who had received one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. Whilst the other two, we're told, went off immediately, did you see that word, and set about putting the money to work. This man does nothing with it at all. He knows his master will return, so inevitably, he's going to face that accounting. But follow from verse 24 how it goes. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you're a hard man, harvesting where you've not sown and gathering where you've not scattered seeds. So I was afraid. I went out and I hid your gold in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. I don't know, as um, Tori read that earlier, it just struck me again. How can he say this? His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. <coughs> so you knew I harvest where I've not sown and gather where I've not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned I'd have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more and they'll have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken away from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Whoa. I wonder how that strikes you as you read. This is tough teaching, isn't it? That third servant may be cowardly, he may be lazy, but does he deserve hell? Is this teaching that if we don't use our gifts properly that we'll end up losing our salvation and being thrown into utter darkness? No, I don't think it's teaching that. We need to read this with the right perspective here. If we take this as a simple moral story of doing good with a focus on how we use our talents, then yes, it does read like that. And it's often taught like that, often at leavers' events at schools, in traditional schools in the UK. But I don't think that that is to read the story the right way. 
if the parable is primarily about God and how he deals with us, then it's teaching something different. Master, he said, I knew that you're a hard man, harvesting where you've not sown and scattering where you've not scattered seed. That is a dreadful slander on this master, isn't it? The master's not hard and stingy and self-serving. Far from it. The master we've seen is extraordinarily generous. Sharing his wealth, letting mere slaves share not only his work on earth, but giving them the great reward at the end, delighting to welcome them in to share his joy. That's generosity. That is not a hard master. Then the servant says he knows what the master's like. Oh no. Like the five foolish bridesmaids, he clearly doesn't have a clue. But more than that, the servant's actions are quite clearly a deliberate refusal to obey his master's will. As the master goes on to point out, this servant knew what his master wanted him to do, but he would not do it. It it wouldn't have been risky to put the money on deposit at the bank. It wouldn't have taken any effort. Bankers are always quite keen to have your money. Have you noticed that? Um, It doesn't matter how cowardly he was or lazy, he wouldn't have had to do a thing. Get this point. We rebel against God by refusing to accept his will for our lives. And we can do that quite passively. We don't actually have to do anything to rebel against God. This servant wasn't condemned for his failure to fulfill his potential. He was condemned for his blatant refusal and determination to thwart his master's will by doing nothing with what he'd been given. And it's for that attitude to his master that he's punished. And it is terrifying, isn't it? To know the will of God and to refuse to do it is to face hell, says Jesus. To say, I know that is the will of God, but I'm going to do this, is to rebel against God. There is a creator God. And like the servants will say in this passage, we all rightly owe to him our lives that he's made and stewarded us to. And he's made it absolutely clear what we're to do with our lives. And when we say, no, I'm I'm not going to, I'm going to do my own thing, And that is to rebel against God. I hope you're not going to do the same. If there are any here who are on the fringe of things, still weighing up, well, where do I stand with Jesus? What am I going to do in my life? Am I going to try to go his way and to follow him and accept his will for my life and to honour him? Or am I just going to say, God, I'm passively going to ignore you the rest of my life. You're just not relevant to me. God isn't harsh or greedy. He wants you to come in and share in the Father's joy. Um, if you're not yet a believer, there is an urgency here. You could be like that man who died at the gym the other day. We never know how long we live. It's time to stop clinging on to control of my life, but to accept Jesus as Lord over your life. It's a bit like driving a car. Um, I don't know if you saw the story this week of an 11-year-old boy stopped on the, the, what was it, the M11, towing a caravan (laughs) at the wheel of a car, and the driver's seat is no place for an 11-year-old. What he needed to do was to let go of the wheel, move over, and let someone competent take control of the car, preferably someone who owned that car. (laughs) If you're clinging on to control of your life and haven't yet given it to Jesus, it's time to let go and let Jesus take the driving seat. And there's a wonderful thing here in God's kingdom. As we lay down our lives for him and his service, our money, our ambitions, our marriages, bit by bit we receive from him, from his generosity, far more than we ever give up. I'm sure you saw that in Albania this week, meeting these people who have chosen to stay there and could leave and have nothing but have joy in the Lord and families and churches growing. So to conclude, does it matter what I do with my life? Yes. yes, thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. It's not your life, though. It's just been entrusted to you temporarily. Jesus is returning, and you and I will give an account of our lives to God. The parable of the bridesmaids tells us that it's not good enough just to look the part. We need to know Jesus personally. The good and faithful servant tells us that we're to use our lives for Jesus' service. And the worthless servant tells me it's time to let go control of my life and give it to Jesus. So, I'd like to finish with some coffee questions. We'll have them again at the end of the service. But do you use one of these. What one thing's most struck you from today's parable? Just ask someone afterwards. Here's a coffee, tea, milk, sugar. What one thing struck you from today's parables? Um, or maybe talk about how you feel about the fate of that third servant. 
Let's pray. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your generosity. Thank you that you want us to share in your happiness. You have the joy of eternity and you delight for heaven to be filled with your people and you're calling to us to do that. We thank you. Thank you that you're not a hard master. Um, that you, you generously entrust us, foolish people, with lives of incredible weight of worth. We thank you for your goodwill, that trusting you to drive will keep us safe on the road and lead us to a good destination. Lord, please help us to joyfully discover each day what it is you put us here for on earth, to seek out the good works you prepared in advance for us to do, and Lord, to delight in the privilege it is to serve you, the King of Kings and our Bridegroom. Amen. Uh, Before I sit down, I've been asked to lead us in a few more general prayers, so I'd just like to spend a couple of minutes leading us in some prayers for the life of this church. Let's pray on. We heard earlier that those who sow in sorrow will reap with joy. Lord, we do pray for those Albanian pastors. Um, Thank you that... Um, Al and others were able to go and spend time with them this week and encourage them. We pray for fruit from that pastor's conference. We pray that those who are laying down their lives in your service there, even at cost to their health and their finances, would um, see your generosity being poured out on Albania, that country which suffered so much under Ember Hodja and under atheism and communism. Thank you that there's freedom to talk about your gospel. And we just pray that they will go on doing that and those churches would grow. We pray particularly for the young children in those churches who are so many in number now. uh, Pray that they'll be discipled well and choose to live and serve that country. We pray for our ongoing link with Albania that we would be an encouragement to them. We pray for their marriages that they would be strong in them and for their health. And we pray that you would provide in their poverty for their needs. Look closer to home, we pray for... um, Gospel sharing in this church. We pray for Christianity Explored. Pray that each time as we meet and read from Mark's Gospel, you would step off the pages of Scripture into people's lives. We pray for the Know Your Worth course, which we hope to run at Wheatley Park School. We do pray that that would be able to go ahead, that the school would welcome it in, and that it would be a way for young girls to to have self-respect and to, to encounter another way of living and knowing you. We pray again for the Cap Money course, starting tomorrow. We pray for those two last spaces to be filled up and for uh, Jill and Naomi to lead it well and for your blessing to be on it, but it would bear fruit. And we pray for those in need in this congregation and we take a moment to do that, thinking particularly of Ian and Erica, uh, where things are half a minute. Pray that they will know your presence with them and that as a congregation we would love them. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.